Hello and welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Midday Lecture Webinar. I'm Adam Smith. I'm the Programme Director for the NIHR National Director for Dementia Research based at University College London. Uh, today I'm delighted to welcome Dr Lillian Hum. Uh, hello Lillian. Hello. Lillian is a Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of British Columbia and Vancouver General Hospital. And as you can see, it looks like she's in work today. So uh, very grateful for her uh, for joining us this morning before her day begins. Uh, Lillian's research mainly focuses on examining how technology and environment uh, impact care experiences of people with dementia. And with a nursing background, you won't be surprised to hear that her research is uh, very practice-based and patient-oriented. And in this webinar, uh, Lillian's going to present her research uh, into using silent disco headphones and technology with older adults uh, staying in dementia care uh, elderly units in hospital, employing video ethnographic design and including conversational interviews and observations. The talk will last around 20 minutes and then we have allowed 10 minutes for questions at the end. If you have any questions, you'll see there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can tap that button, type your question in any time throughout the presentation or at the end, and then I will put the questions to Lillian and we will record the answers so you can uh, hear them. And we're also recording today's uh, lecture, so if you drop out, don't worry. You can watch this back via our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars. Uh, probably from some time tomorrow. So thank you very much everybody for joining us again. Thank you Lillian. Uh, over to you if you could um, share your screen now. I am here in, um, in Canada, Vancouver. And um, thank you Adam for the opportunity. This is a project that happened actually right here in the Vancouver General Hospital where I work clinically. Like you have introduced me that I am a nurse and I'm a clinician researcher. So I wear three hats. I work at the clinical nurse specialist in the hospital right here. I also teach nursing student at UBC and I do research to kind of look at the clinical problems and for my patients and I see what are some of the things that I could work with patient partners and family partners and clinicians together to address those problems. So I will talk a little bit about my methodologies and in Canada here we call them patient oriented research. So um, just a little bit of a background for those people that who work with uh, older adults in geriatrics especially people with cognitive impairment, dementia. These are the common problems that you often will see, like people uh, may face like stress, like with the daily life and anxiety, loneliness, the 3Ds, you know, dementia, depression, delirium. We see them in our clinical setting all the time. So my research looks at how the everyday technology that we can use to help mitigate some of these problems, try to support people, their health and well-being. So not just you know, uh, try to you know, manage behavior problem, but it's more about trying to look at the positive approach that could help support people's health and well-being. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about music and the silent disco headphones technology. So, I mean, we all know music, it's well known that it will help to calm, it does help calm our anxiety and offer some psychological benefits. And um, many of us use music on a daily basis for our mood. And uh, just, you know, a lot of time we just use it just to feel good, especially these days, the exceptional times of the COVID-19 pandemics. Researchers, uh, some of them, like, like us, we are not allowed to go to the research office to work. I work in the clinical setting, but we're not allowed to go to the lab or um, the, you know, inside the university to work and all of the conferences are canceled, we can't travel. And during the lockdown, we all feel the stress, right? And um, I certainly use music myself to regulate my own emotions. So, but this project is more than music. We use uh, the technology, it's called Silent Disco. The Silent Disco headphone has um, noise cancellations, kind of like what I'm wearing that has noise cancellation. It also has a DJ microphone that will allow the therapist of the facilitator to speak directly to the patient's ears. So it's wireless. And um, what is really special about these headphones is it has a really extended distance that, that cover for um, broadcasting music from a transmitter. So it's not through uh, Bluetooth, it's through uh, an F 
AM signals. It means that even patients, they can be in the far distance, like all the way down to that person could be in the last room in the hallway. They could still, uh, my transmitter could be, you know, somewhere on the other end. They could, or even people on the different floor, we have tried it, you know, we try the headphone down outside, um, across uh, the hospital in the park, people could still listen, listen to the, um, the music really well. So the transmission works really well for far distance. Um, so rather than, you know, typically when we run music program before we have the headphones, we will just use a speaker system and the headphone can be, um, like without the headphones, it can sometimes uh, music to one person's ears could be noise to the others. So, you know, and per music could be very personal as well. So for some other people, they don't like the second kind of music and could be a noise to them as well. But the headphone allow us to deliver the high quality music silently. When I say silently, it means that there's no noise in the environment for the others and that uh, will does not disturb uh, the others when they're not using the music. And another feature of these um, silent disco headphones is it has three channels. So the patient can actually choose their own preference. They can listen to classical music, jazz, or soft music that, um, to their own personal preference. So why? Why the headphones? So for this particular population. So it's very interesting that um, we saw that um, these silent disco headphones have been used by the younger populations for disco parties in the past. So people have a lot of fun with um, music and they dance, they, they could use this um, in the apartment so that they could have a, um, they could play it very loud, but it won't disturb others and they won't, they won't get into the trouble that the police ring the doorbell. And um, so it has gone um, very popular among the, uh, young adult populations. And I heard some of the colleagues that they went on vacations, that they went to Lake, uh, Las Vegas or Hawaii. They went to the big hotel resort and they, they went to uh, these um, silent disco parties. So we thought, wow, okay, so it works so well for the younger adults. I was wondering that how maybe we can see, it may also work for our uh, older adults with cognitive impairment in a clinical setting and see what kind of benefits that it might bring. And, um, so what it's unique about this headphone for the uh, population with dementia, I think there's three unique things. First of all, it delivers high quality music. It good, it's good for the aging years. So with um, um, aging years, a lot of our uh, patients, um, older adults, with um, they don't hear so well and they have a lot of problem with hearing, but with the high quality um, sound that go directly into their ears that helps them to uh, enjoy, have a more immersive experience. Um, the second thing is it has the noise cancellation feature. So it's perfect for people who have cognitive impairment because with a healthy brain, we can filter things that, that, uh, that we don't need to hear. But for people they uh, experience dementia or delirium or cognitive impairment, everything comes to their brain. They lost that function to filter things so to concentrate. So it makes it very hard for them to focus with the noise cancellation um, features. Then um, the distractions are uh, filtered out, so it makes it easier for them not to have uh, to listen and to focus, and um, so they can avoid that sensory overload by trying to pay attention to everything that's happening in the environment. Um, another thing is um, the DJ mic, and having the DJ mic, uh, often when we put the headphones on the person, when we speak to them in the, with the DJ mic, and um, they would say, "Oh, wow, I could hear you." because part of it is a noise cancellation and part of it is how that, that sound is deliver, delivered directly into that person's ear. So that really helped them to focus and to engage in a, in a program that we want them to be, um, to be a part of, to take part in, yeah. So I mentioned about um, patient-oriented research. So we use uh, what we call POR here in Canada. And this person holding the camera, it's, um, it's Luca. Luca, it's a family partner. And uh, he helps us to make use of the research, uh, make sure the research really focus on what matters to the patients. So he has a family member who um, has mental uh, illness. So he has been involved right from the get go for the whole uh, research uh, process. So, um, so he, when we discuss about research methods, he and um, like what we want to get from the research to make sure that you know the, what we do will actually benefit patient care. So we use uh, video ethnography methodology. So a lot of um, work that we do is going out there to 
um, when we run the music programs and um, we'll go out to a video and see how people um, interact with the technology. So um, we're, we try to focus on people's experience and look at the hospital environment and you know, the clinical context. So it's a little bit different than trying to measure or uh, um, uh, to rate um, a particular um, behaviors. So um, this is um, the four core principles of uh, the strategies of patient-oriented research, what we call SPORE here. And I think in the UK, people call, you, you, you guys call them PPI, patient and public involvement. So I think essentially it's pretty much the same, the same thing. So the four principles are inclusiveness, support, mutual respect, and co -build. So um, So in our team that we have, um, 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 interdisciplinary team members, we have music therapists, we have nurses, we have OT, um, um, we also have patient and family partners. Um, uh, in the beginning, then we look at the, uh, the existing literature and then uh, we plan the research together, we apply for the research together and um, we talk about the methods together and you can see the picture that I showed before that Luca went out to collect that data with us together and we bring the footage back to um, do team analysis and um, we're writing a, a manuscript for submissions and, um, and uh, Luca will be part, uh, an author of the co-author of the research as well. So when we go out to uh, present in the conference and Luca will also speak uh, with us together as well. So, so we also, so we try very hard and uh, to, to learn from each other. So people bring in different type of knowledge, patient and family partners, they bring in their lived experience perspective and the expertise about, you know, living with the illness. So, um, so and clinicians bring their, um, you know, the clinical uh, knowledge and how, what will work in the environment and researchers bring their research methodology. So the, the research that we do is really, like we try to co-build. Yeah. This is just an example of uh, uh, how um, when we publish and we often will include, um, we'll work with um, patient and family partners to, with the whole team to prepare the manuscript and then they will be co-authors in the publication as well. So these are the two research questions, very straightforward. And um, oh, we want to look at uh, what are the patients experience of participating in the silent music program and we also want to look at the staff perspective about using their music interventions to support patient care. So this is a, a picture of uh, in the beginning of the program that this is Ben and the names that I use, um, it's pseudo names, except there's one name that um, um, I will speak to that a little bit later. So you can see Ben is sitting there like he's quite animated when he's listening to the music and this is um, in um, in a common area, so there's actually the physicians behind and talking to our patients. You probably only see her head and um, the back of her body. And there's another person sitting next to Ben. He, he at that time, he was actually quite psychotic and he was like swearing. He was quite angry and quite loud, but that definitely didn't seem to bother Ben at all. He was just having a great time listening to the music and dancing. His facial expressions were very, very animated. So I'll show you uh, some of the, the video footage of, our, uh, of the data that we had. Um, this is Molly. Molly, that day when we, um, when we were working with her, she was having a lot of pain. The pain that she has really hindered her functions. And she gets very sad a lot of times. She just sits in the chair and try to tolerate her pain. And um, the pain, um, the, but when we, um, um, invite her to the music program. Um, the music just gave her, uh, I think it's a positive distraction. She got up and danced and um, it was amazing to see that how it changed her, her mood. And um, let's just see how she... Um yeah, so you can see how she danced and you know her facial expressions and that just like, she kind of forgot about, you know, the pain that she had. And um, yeah, it was like, it was just within, uh, a few minutes and that was a substantial change in how she um she was uh, uh experiencing about her 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 that day so um and right after the um the dance and uh, luca our uh, family partners did an interview with um with molly how'd you like the headphones yeah they were good yeah did you like yeah. how they were they weren't like uncomfortable or no yeah? yeah how did you like feel about using the headphones for you i think they're good yeah the music is more 
impulsive as yeah. opposed to Fine track. Yeah. yeah. Because this way you can concentrate on the music and listening to it and without being destroyed by the... Around you, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that you so you enjoy the music more with the headphones, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. And also, what was your favorite song again? The Neil one, right? Neil Diamond. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I guess any other like impressions you had at the end, how you felt after? No, it's good. I think it's really. Um, yeah, this was the second time we mm -hmm. used it. The second, yeah, you did it last week, right? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. How was this week compared to last week, you think? Well, last week was a little bit... Uh, this was better because we, we had used it once. Right. And so we kind of knew what to expect. Normally, we, um, we interview a, a person at least, try to at least two to three four times and then with Molly that we worked with her a few times and that was the second time that she used the headphone. And um, this Donald, it's very tricky to try to understand the response of um, people with dementia um, in, in our setting because sometimes it's really hard to judge uh, how do they really like the music, do they enjoy it by just looking at their facial expressions. But Donald, Donald often he just had a very flat um, facial expression, or he he just show up. He look just look angry. So it's really hard to know that like like how he how he feels about using a technology. If we just use a facial scale to measure his response, I'm sure that we would have missed a whole lot of the richness of his his experience because he just doesn't smile. His face always like just look kind of angry, and he's always just look quite tense. So when he first admitted to the hospital, he refused to leave his room and uh, he didn't want anyone to go near him. It really, it took us a while to build trust, um, but music was the bridge. He slowly accepted the heaven in his room. So we started with giving the heaven in his room by himself. So he joined a group in his, he was in his room and the rest of the, the group were in, um, in a common area. And then he came out for, he came out to just have a look and then I think he stayed for two minutes and he didn't sit down, he just kind of walk around with the headphone for two minutes. And then he slowly go join the group for, like for five minutes and have a look at this one. And you tell me that like, does that mean that he likes the music or not? You can definitely see his face look kind of angry, but with you, when we did the team analysis, we watched the rhythm of how he tapped that chair or something. Like at first we thought, like he's angry. Was he angry? He's just you know, uh, hitting the chair, but he was actually tapping the the chair with along with the music, and it was very interesting that um, after a little while, and uh, he came out, and uh, he took um, um, our staff, uh, Gail, he took her hand, and he took her to the side of the room and he invited her for a dance. Have a look. I think that's the best smile that you can get from, <laughs> from Donald. <laughs> this is Mary. So Mary said, uh, when we did the interview, Mary said the headphone helped her to get into the mood right away. It's kind of a little bit like what Molly said in the beginning. It's, a, it's quite a consistent theme that people said that the headphone does make a difference. But then the way they articulated, um, it's a, um, the words they use a little bit differently. But for Mary, she said, the headphone helped me to get into the mood right away. I love dancing and I like singing too. So she, she got some really good moves. So have a look. <laughs> Yeah. 
Johnny let all the little shoes that don't shoot. Have on my blue shoes. You can do anything on my blue sweaty shoes. All right. For the money, for the show. Get ready to go. So this is Gary. This is his real name for all the other persons that I use a pseudonym, but I use uh, Gary's real name. Um, he insisted when we do a presentation that we would use his real name. Gary is a very interesting person. The day we were filming Mary, Gary asked me how he may enroll himself in the study because he saw that we were using the headphones and we were, um, we were carrying a camcorder. And uh, I went to explain to him about the study and the, the consent. And uh, I offered him the option to use a pseudonym and for protection. And, um, or we can use his new, real name for acknowledgement. He told me, Lillian, it's very, very important to me that you use my real name. And then the family came in the afternoon. I checked with, with them again. The family said, yes, you better use his real name. So through this, I, it really taught me that, that a, a very important lesson, not to make any assumptions. Because sometimes for some people, in fact, actually for many people, in my experience when I work with them, um, um, you know, uh, uh, patients and um, family partners, and uh, they voice their opinions. Like to be able to voice their opinions and contribute to research uh, to produce knowledge about themselves, it's something that they feel very proud of. So in the past, that I have uh, some publications that um, I use pseudonym of a uh, um, um, of the participants. So they, sometimes they would came back to me, and in fact, some of the clinicians they came back to me. They said why they were being called a different name in the publications and. So from like after that, that I, I learned that you know when I um when I apply for ethics and always included in the consent that we'll have an option for people to to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah, that just that's just scary. It's not a real cigarette. It's a plastic cigarette. But um, that just show you his character. This is a, a interview that I did with Gary. Okay, Gary. So, what was it like to be here with other people to listen to music? Lillian, mm -hmm. it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Can you say a little bit more? The music group was rhetorical. Oh. Lillian, rhetorical. They were boys and girls of various ages. Mm -hmm. My favorite was you with that. Um, Lillian. Rhetorical means assembly. Uh, Lillian. You need to explain that to me. I don't understand. All right. Now, uh -huh. um, rhetorical means enhancing a team. Used in literature and voices of uh -huh. contradiction. Yeah. I was wondering that um, you got and danced with me. And what was that like? It was wonderful. We danced together. Lillian, when I was a teenager, I went to a gay bar. Okay. And danced for two in the morning. So, and after that, he um, talked a lot about like um, his experience in a younger age and remnants. Yeah. Um, this is Bill. Bill has Parkinson's dementia. So he had a very tough time uh, at the time when we were doing the film, um, doing the study. That uh, he, um, we hear a lot of. Um, uh, difficulties with care and um, the family uh, was hearing a lot of um, negative uh, things that had happened that how like he hit the staff and he wouldn't let staff to provide care so a lot of um, sad things that happened at that time so we did uh, we invited him to um, to the music group and um, I showed the wife this uh, video 
And when he watched the video, he was in tears. He told me that um, you got to show this to the staff. This is my husband. So it really, it, it really brings out, you know, the person when we talk about the person behind the, the symptoms, because sometimes it can be so focused on what's not going so well and uh, what are those uh, behavioral symptoms and forget about, you know, the person. And by watching this video, that, that can actually remind people that, that the other side of him. If you notice a sudden movement that uh, Bill was having, like he was, um, he was snapping his fingers and trying to cl clap, and uh, he was also trying to move his mouth to sing it as well. So it was a very moving uh, clip for um, for the family and also for the staff to see. This is my um, uh, another slide that talked about. Uh, we we ran a, a meditation program, and uh, uh, this person said that uh, it offered her, him an escape. Um, it was very soothing and refreshes his sense, the inner thought. So um, just I'm going to wrap it up. I know I'm running out of time. And um, just these are some of the lessons learned that we uh, we had. And um, the program offered positive activities for the, staff, uh, for the person for health and wellness and um, pain management reminiscence. And it also offers some flexibility because um, how it could uh, – uh, allow people that to join either in the room or in this uh, with others in the common areas with the group so it works really well especially during this time that when we have to put people in isolation um, these are the barriers that you know to be able, you need to have uh, leadership support to get the equipment you know the staff attitude to use it and um, and uh, also in the beginning that's a, a little bit of a um, uh, learning curve to use how uh, to use that um, the technology as well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, so if people have questions, if you um, would like to post those at the bottom now, I, I found that particularly fascinating. I had a couple of questions of my, my own. Have you um, been able to try using with this with, with people who uh, may be uh, less mobile and, and had to remain in their beds? Or um, did you try using it in that way as well totally we had um well um we had a, um actually right in the beginning that we had a person that who was very um very very sick um end of life and um she just um went to um she had um uh, iv insertions and he was he was just he was feeling very very sick and he was in her in her room is not able to come out she was quite weak and frail as well and um, so we put the headphone on with Alphas. She set up and um, she actually, she moves her body a little bit with the, with the music. It was just, it was amazing to see that. And not only um, she, it, it's really wonderful for her to, uh, to, um, to be able to enjoy that, but it also helped the, the staff to see how she enjoyed it. I think it's, it does some magics about, um, to um, help staff to see that person-centered care, that when they are able to help someone to um, not just, you know, we, we always like try to focus on clinical thing, you know, looking after her IVs and her medications or, you know, try to manage, you know, all the clinical tasks, but this offers staff to see the other side of her, like, yeah. And I suppose, it, I mean, the interesting thing is, of course, hospitals have had hospital radio and headphones for a long time, which, which people could choose to do. But I suppose having the option to use this technology allows you to pay, perhaps be a little bit more structured in what you're delivering to individuals rather than forcing them. Although I guess um, you could do that anyway. Right, let's, let's go to the questions. We've got quite a few here. Um, Anna Valentin Marsh uh, asks, hi, thank you for your time today. Do the headphones work well for those using uh, hearing aids? Yeah, that was very interesting. Uh, it worked really well. Um, it, I, I think it's maybe it's louder. Like I don't, I don't know. It will work well for everyone, but for the sample of the for the participants that we have uh, used, and you know, I think 
half of the times when people put those hearing aid into their ears, those hearing actually don't work so well. So um, when we put the headphones on, they just take the hearing aid out and they just put the headphone on and they seem to hear because we can see how they respond to the music, yeah. And do they, do, do, just to, uh, to add to that, do they have, you know, like um, modern headphones you'd use domestically, have microphones built into them so you can hear yourself talk yeah. or so you're not going to shout when you're wearing them? No, no. yeah, it has uh, uh, that, um, that DJ mic so you can hear yourself as well. I yeah. see. Uh, thank you for that question, Anna. I hope we've addressed that. Uh, Melissa Elliott asks, thank you for sharing your research. It's very interesting. Can I ask if you found an optimal amount of time and frequency for engaging with the specialist headphones have, and did you come across any adverse reactions? Um, optimal time, um, it's very individual. So like what I talk about Donald, for him in the beginning, it might be two minutes and then five minutes. And some people would like to... Um, um, they come in to join and then they would uh, put the headphones down and they go to the hallway, they go for a walk and then come back. And so it's really individual. Some people could sit down and listen to it for a long time. And some people would put it on and they, they like to hum along and sing with it for, yeah, again and again. And um, so it's very different for each individual. And uh, the uh, adverse reactions. Yeah, so some, it's not for everyone. Some people don't just don't like to have the headphones over their head, and for those, and they would just take it off and they shake their head. They don't want them, so we don't impose. Yeah. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, and uh, Demana um, asks, how did you choose the music that was played through the headphones? Yeah, so we're very fortunate. We work with a, a music therapist who. Um, Kevin is very experienced and he knows the population really well. And he has like thousands and thousands of songs in, the, in his uh, albums. So, um, so, so uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, we learn about the music from families. Family would tell us, you know, they like this kind of music, but we are um, sometimes, you know, what the family said can be quite different than what the actual the person presented. <laughs> They change the taste. So we also check with the, the person. And a lot of the time, uh, it's, you know, it's trying it on and see how people respond. Sometimes you will be surprised that the, the person had never listened to that kind of music before and, and they liked it. Yeah. And so when, when you were delivering that in a group way, did each individual able to listen to the music of their choice? I mean, I know I have elderly relatives who love jazz or classical music, but, you know, hate rock and roll and, and other people that would be quite the opposite. So you can deliver specific tunes to specific people. Yeah, the headphone has uh, three channels. So there's three colors. So they could switch uh, to the music that they like. And I was actually like, to be honest, I was quite surprised with people that they are in the like, moderate and later stage. And they were able to use that thumb to switch the music and control the volume of the music as well. So like, I was quite impressed, yeah, by <laughs> the ability to do that, yeah. It's, it's quite interesting you can see how you could deliver that in a, uh, particularly perhaps in a nursing home as well, where obviously activities to alleviate kind of some of the boredom and anxieties and, and some of the issues that uh, care home residents have, you can imagine that delivering that session as a specific kind of session um, will be quite interesting. Um, Melissa uh, Elliott asks, what was the cost? Which is a good question. <laughs> um, oh, there are... There are so many different companies out there that um, you can do your search. And um, yeah, so our uh, set was uh, bought, um, funded by the um, hospital foundation here. We pay $3,000. So which is not bad that we have a, a transmitter, uh, which is quite sophisticated you now. But they help us to, they also provide the initial IT support that help us to set it up. And um, we have 20 sets of headphones, yeah. And those headphones are not expensive. You can replace them. And um, they also comes with um, um, like um, the materials, like just cover your ears that is also replaceable and you can oh, wipe they, them with- uh, yeah, the pants. Yeah, yeah. And you can wipe them down with um, disinfectant uh, wipes, yeah. 
Fantastic. Uh, the next question is from uh, Rebecca uh, Lepping, who asks, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Did you compare the live experience without headphones at all since the therapist was in the common room? Yes, and uh, we, we, we did both. We actually did a whole bunch of different things. So we did the live uh, music. We also use um, just the music that play um, on, the, um, on the iPod. And uh, we also uh, played a meditation program that we just use the app, um, the Calm, the free app. And um, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, there are so many um, opportunities out there with the technology and a lot of those are good um, um, meditation apps. And I think we will further explore that. And we find people respond quite well to that as well when we do like breathing exercise together. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was actually going to be my next question is about how you diversify from music. Of course, music, I think, is a good body of evidence building up to show how useful uh, it is. But I, I wondered whether you'd considered how you might use this for meditation or for other therapies or, for, you know, delivering exercise, you know, different things that you might do, guidance. Yeah, people really enjoy uh, listening to nature sounds. And um, those people that they are in those uh, meditation apps, they have just a beautiful voice, a calming voice. And um, people in the hospital often they feel quite anxious and uh, worry about, you know, um, you know what's going to happen next. And you know, and um, those meditation app works really well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a few of us are turning to those in the, in the current <laughs> climate. Um, we have another question um, from Li Hu who asks, thank you Lillian for a great presentation. Could you share your experiences and tips for interviewing people with dementia? So a little bit of a different topic, but you seem to get good engagement from people there. How, how would you approach that? Uh, to interview people with dementia? Um, I, I think my biggest tip is not to make any assumptions because um, it's easy that when um, that you go to a clinical setting, especially if you don't know them and you go in there and you ask the staff, they said, uh, like, can I talk to the patients? And sometimes they may say, oh, you, well, you know, this person has dementia and you probably won't get very much out of them. And, um, you know, I, a lot of times I actually find that when I go sit down with that person, if you're able to, you know, to bring the stress down, to build a report with that person. And I don't know. I. It, I find that, you know, the camera actually does magic. I have done quite a few studies with the video ethnography now, and people, people, people enjoy speaking about, telling people about their, their opinions, about you know, their experience, their stories. And um, yeah, so um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but um, planning ahead of time, letting the person know that you'll be coming in tomorrow in the afternoon. And I have seen my patients that will go wash the hair, you know, prepare, put makeup on. They know they're going to be interviewed and they love it. And um, yeah, and the other, other times, and it's really when I did the social robot project, it's really about, you know, bringing the stress down and having some casual in, uh, uh, conversation so it's just like having having yeah. a flexible approach there so people who would hate the idea of being recorded can say no but other people would enjoy it and so being able to do that and, and I completely agree the you know not taking the assumption or even even family's word for it saying oh there's no point or the staff saying yeah you won't you won't get anything from them because I think I completely agree actually that you you absolutely try and, and see how you go and take that kind of calm approach and you can be surprised about the, the outcomes. And the environment makes a huge difference. So when I do ethnography, I go to their, their place, right? It's their place. So it's different than when you bring someone into your office and um, you know, then you do a formal interview, then you probably won't get, it's very hard for people to remember what happened in the past, but with the video ethnography that when you're asking them thinking things that ha actually happening in the setting so they just finish listening to the music so it's very easy for them to tell you what they think about you know using the technology but if you bring them to the office the day after or you know uh, two weeks after and so they probably won't tell you very much they probably don't remember because with their memory impairment or you know the stress that they feel they're being interviewed but when you're doing ethnography that they are just having a conversation with you right so it's very different it's yeah. i think it's the stress right you bring the stress down it's having a little chat yeah yeah um we've got a question from demana 
who asks, uh, did you find any long standing effects in the participants over time? For example, after they participated a few times in the silent disco, did you improve any, notice any improvements in their mood or reduction in their agitation? I, I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> so um, I didn't do any uh, um, um, uh, measure for sustain, sustained effects. And um, there's so many confounding factors that they are, they're in the hospital, they're taking medications, right? And there are um, other, there's so many things that's happening with the disease and, you know, and what they're going through. So it's really hard to tell that, you know, it was actually, it's the music that's actually bringing the benefits. And, um, but for us, even having the immediate effects so that people really enjoy in the moment, for me, that, that's good enough. And for our patient and family partners, when we were in that research, we saw those uh, dramatic response. And uh, that was like, we thought that was real well, well worth it. Yeah. And you can see how this is a great kind of start study, but building on from this, how you could add in that kind of a little bit of qualitative measures to try and understand kind of benefits to mood and reduction in agitation over a longer term. And also particularly as well, I think I'd be really excited about the idea of trying this in a structured way in a ward over the course of a day for delivering, you know, kind of bed based exercise, for example, um, and, and being able to do that in such a way where the person in beds one, five, seven and eight can participate on one program and the people in three other beds could do a different one or not participate at all and doing that in that kind of silent way where where you're not disturbing the clinical uh, you know the environment you're not disturbing the patient in bed number 10 who who is you know ill and needs their sleep um, so it's fantastic. I think it's a really exciting, innovative way to use that. And the staff can throw them on all on and have a party in the evening, right? <laughs> and not disturb the patients. I mean, that's the real thing. Did you find nurses kind of using them in the evening? <laughs> nurses and doctors using them in the evening to, to party I, and not disturb the patients? I wouldn't know. They wouldn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much Lillian for your time uh, we don't have any more questions um, you might be interested to know actually we are recording a podcast um, on use of uh, music therapy and uh, dementia and the 2020 dementia music program um, with some people who are here today we're going to be recording that in a few weeks time so watch our podcast feed dementia researcher to to hear more about uh, use of music as a, as a therapy for dementia. Uh, thank you very much, Lillian. We're really grateful for you agreeing to share with us today. Um, if anybody has any questions that you didn't want to ask, uh, you can find Lillian, Lillian on Twitter and her Twitter name is at Nurse Lillian with two L's in the middle. Um, our next webinar will be on uh, at 12 noon on Thursday, the 14th of May, when we have Dr. By Byron Kreese from Exeter University discussing, di discussing, discussing mild behavioral impairment, an emerging concept in cognitive aging and preclinical dementia. Uh, as I said earlier, the recording from today will be able to be found on our website, uh, probably sometime later today or tomorrow, and that's dementiaresearch.nahr.ac.uk forward slash webinars, and that's where you'll find details to register for our next one as well. And finally, just a call out, if anybody would like to present their own research um, during one of our, uh, through one of our webinars, please drop us a line on Twitter at dem underscore researcher or using the contact us page on our website. We'd be delighted to give you the opportunity to, to share your work. Thank you very much again, Lillian. Thank you to everybody who's taken time to join us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>